Welcome to the Joe Watt Podcast. I am Joe Vendermini from the Range Cattle Research and Education Center at ONA. And today our guest is Gary Fike from Kansas. Gary, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate the uh, invitation. It's a great opportunity to get uh, uh, back connected with you after knowing you for so many years now. Thank you, Gary. And Gary, can you please give us some uh, background information about yourself? Sure, sure. So um, going back to the uh, olden days, I was I was uh, raised on a farm here in Kansas, diversified crop and livestock farm, got a degree in ag ed and animal science and ruminant nutrition. And I've, I've been in extension for 23 years, but uh, in the middle, um, I just came back to K-State Research and Extension here about two years ago. Uh, I worked for Certified Angus Beef as a beef cattle specialist and a feedlot specialist. And then um, also for four and a half more years, I worked for the Red Angus Association as director of commercial marketing. So I worked with people who were using Red Angus bulls in their commercial operations and helping them with uh, finding marketing avenues for their calves. And, and Gary, uh, that is uh, probably what we're going to cover today because I think your experience in the in the feedlot business is is quite vast. So I, I think we will start talking about those those here today. And one thing that we have heard, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about, is is the way the cattle is grading now that is quite different from what happened in the past. And we have that spike in the in the choice. And this is likely related to several factors, but I would like to, to hear your thoughts about how that evolved over time and, and how we got here. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that the spike, if you want to, and I, I, I think the spike is here to stay long term now, but, you know, when we used to kind of hope that a pin of cattle would grade 65, 70% choice, we thought that that was wonderful. And as a matter of fact, there was one breed association that it, their, their goal was 70% uh, choice and 70% yield grade ones and twos, which, is, which was a really good goal at the time. And when I started with CAB, and that was in 2004, I think the average percent choice was maybe 68 to 72, somewhere in there. But there's a lot of cattle uh, pens that were only grading about 50% um, choice. So you have a lot of you know, of cattle that don't have as much marbling in them. Uh, but then most cattle were uh, marketed on a live or a carcass weight basic basis. And uh, they used to call it the old, the old cattle feeders called it grade and steel when you would sell on a grid um, uh, that we know that, that we call them today, uh, where you would get discounts for heavy and fat carcasses and premiums for uh, upper choice and prime cattle. But a lot of times those discounts took, took that away. But with the advent of, of more uh, marbling and because consumers demanded it, uh, we, we knew we had uh, taste and tenderness tests at universities that showed the consumers preferred a choice or higher grading product. And so as the packing industry recognized that, then the demand for higher grading cattle came into play and and they started paying more for it. And consumers now are so used to it. So, so now somebody tells me, well, I had a pen of cattle that graded 90% choice and it's like, so what? I mean, that's, that's not that uncommon anymore. Uh, the industry as a whole is grading near 80% choice and, and eight to 10% prime, which leaves very few select or standard carcasses in the, in the fat cattle mix. So it's just evolved over time and now it's the standard basically. I don't know if we'll ever, you know, go back from that. It doesn't seem like we will, but that's kind of how that's happened. And, and Gary, um, there are several factors that probably play in that situation that you go right now that it's favorable, it's a good situation. But do you think that we probably um, had some uh, trade-offs when we focus so much on the quality, do you think that we may have lost something on the quantity? Well, I think that the quantity, yes, I, I think there's, there's uh, that's true to a certain extent. Uh, we, the, the other thing is, in terms of quantity, we do feed cattle to heavier weights now. So that's a big thing. But the, the, I think the, the bigger thing here that we're talking about, when you talk about 
losing maybe you're maybe giving up some muscle okay if you focus a lot on the quality grade the marbling you can give up muscle in some instances and and it, there's no question that uh, continental breeds of cattle typically will be higher yielding um, on a carcass weight basic dressing percent basis so you're obviously going to have uh, a better carcass yield lower numerical um, uh, yield grades, which lend to higher premiums as well, because we do pay, or packers do pay, premiums for yield grade one and yield grade two over the industry average of yield grade three. And then, and of course, yield grade fours and fives are discounted to a great extent right now, particularly 20 to $35 a hundred weight on the carcass weight basis. So yeah, I think sometimes we give up a little bit of that, not a, not a great deal, but enough to uh, make a difference. And and just translating to to a um, uh, an industry that is quite popular here in Florida, as you know, that is the cow calf, right? Uh, many, many of the producers here they they don't feed their cattle, and so they market the calves. And 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 then you know um, my my question for you is: everybody is paying the price to have that better animal? Or do you think that through the segment of beef cattle production, such as cow calf, stalker, uh, feedlot, and packing plant, so do you think that the, the little higher cost to accomplish and reach that uh, choice has been distributed equally? Or do you think that there are some segments that probably uh, are carrying the heavier load? Well, so I'm going to go back to a statement I heard a long time ago that that David Nichols, who's a seed stock, very famous seed stock producer in, in Iowa, said a long time ago, and 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 I will repeat that with his permission, is that every dollar that is generated in the beef industry comes out of the consumer's wallet. So if you if you take that into account, you they will they will definitely pay more for a higher quality product and that feeds back through the system. So that's why the packer will pay more for a premium choice product while they were paid right now, $20 a hundred weight for a prime over a choice carcass. So going back, the, the thing about it is the person who has the last ownership and that's generally the feedlot or the custom, the, the, the person who owns the cattle in the feedlot probably stands to benefit the most from that uh, throughout the whole beef supply chain. So the cow-calf producer, and you're talking about him or her, their deal is they want the most dollars for their calf at sale time. So they really don't care, um, or they shouldn't, what color, what whatever else is going on there. But the person who's buying that calf, whether it's a stalker operator or a feedlot or a backgrounder, that's going to reflect back on the price of that calf. So we know that that does feed all the way through, but probably not distributed as equally. Okay. And in a lot of cases, you could argue that the backgrounder or the stalker operator that buys the cattle that go into the feed yard may be picking up. I mean, the cow calf producer may, in some instances, because they don't take the risk of owning the cattle through the feeding period, they maybe have the least skin in the game in terms of the price they paid for a particular set of bulls or semen, uh, because they don't care what happens a lot of times after they leave the ranch. Yeah. And Gary, we are facing now um, the situation where the price of corn went up again. And can you please give us some updates and what is the current situation on the feedlots there in the Midwest? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, right now cost of gains. I mean, they could be as cheap as the high 90 cents. They could they could be as expensive as a buck 15, but it's going to be between a dollar five and a dollar ten a pound to, to put on that gain. And so when you're selling live market, the last few weeks has been anywhere from $1.24 to $1.30, uh, most of them about $1.26. So when you're putting it on for $1.10 and getting $1.26, you're gonna feed the heavier weights. 
but but feedlots are buying heavier cattle all the time. You know, it's used to be you put a steer in the feedlot six, seven hundred pounds. Now it's eight, nine, eleven hundred pounds uh, because they're backgrounding them longer in a lot of cases when the cost of grain gets this high. And, uh, you know, the future, we don't know what the future holds. Uh, I don't think the corn crop is going to be as great, maybe as it has been the past few years, because we've had some droughty conditions in some areas. So I would expect the price of corn to remain steady to moving higher. Uh, there will be a harvest dip. But so what I'm saying is I think that cost of gain is going to continue to go up. And, um, you know, through the winter months, especially when you're feeding in the northern states, it's like, Nebraska and Iowa, well, your cost of gain is going to go up a little bit too because you got colder weather and then higher grain prices could could be an issue. And uh, you touch on an important point that is those um, heavier animals going to the feedlot, so they stay in the background period a little longer because they probably have a cheaper gain there. So um, do, do you think that that will will be the balance so more cattle will stay longer in the backgrounding and so the feedlots will will be quite loose on their on their capacity i i think they'll probably still uh, fill up uh, and that won't be an issue they'll just come later and it'll be delayed so i think that's really the only thing you're looking at but those those feedlots you know, have gotten to be very creative in how and where and why they buy the cattle that they do. As some of the larger feeding groups will sit down um, and spend a lot more time calculating what they can pay to even break even. And some will, as we say, shoot from the hip or bet on the come on the back end and will go ahead and buy cattle. They know they don't look very good. Uh, right now on on paper, but so many of them anymore build in $50 to $75 in their break even on the backside, knowing they'll get that premium for grid sold cattle. So they'll, you know, if 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 the price of cattle is $1.26, they're gonna figure maybe $1.28 or 29 because they're gonna sell them on a grid and they're gonna get more money for them. So they'll build that into their to their break-even costs. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of different things to go. And they started doing that probably 15 years ago when the premium started really being worth something. And uh, in, in Kansas, you have a, a, a pretty um, elaborated and significant background in operations there in the Flint Hills. So people used to do that. They have a tradition of doing that. Have you seen that the feedlots are trying to do a little more backgrounding and be involved in the operation as well over there? Or because I, I dealt with some feedlots in Texas, and it seems that they have a lot of them that, that they wanted to get involved in the in the backgrounding because they can feed well. You know, they, they have a, a good nutrition program. Is that the, the trend over there as well? That's definitely true. I mean, there's uh, we've got feedlots in southwest Kansas that, own a lot of farm ground and they'll maybe have an irrigated uh, pivot uh, and they'll they'll grow uh, a lot of times crabgrass uh, or other uh, warm season um, grasses and put them on that for a while to cheapen up the overall cost of gain, you know. So they do that, they lease grass from other places, they have access to uh, custom graziers or custom backgrounders if they don't do it themselves where they'll say, hey, I'm going to send it to uh, Bob down the road because he can he can put that on for 80 cents a pound because when they get here, it's going to be a buck. So yeah, feedlots have a lot of that uh, going on and, and, and they will uh, balance what their uh, cattle are on feed and uh, in backgrounding situation or in grazing operations. Uh, as to what the market dictates to them. Gary, um, we are going towards the, the end of our conversation here. Again, I, I really would like to thank you for your time and participating in the podcast. And I am Joe Vendramini. Joe what? <laughs>